I was on a trip with my wife to Maine where we rented a cabin to try to disconnect a little and maybe get to enjoy some real privacy and romance. At night, we would drink wine and spend quality time together, ignoring our phones since we could not get a cell phone signal and the Wi-Fi was incredibly unreliable. During the day, we would visit farms, docks, lighthouses, and other main attractions. The day before we were supposed to leave, we decided to explore the main botanical garden. You could not take two steps without seeing a whole new breed of plant or insect. The whole place was a sensory overload. We moved slowly, because everything was worthy of a photo. The dahlias were gorgeous, the pumpkins huge and imposing, the various herbs fragrant and green. Structures covered in vines, mossy ponds, huge shady gardens. It really was the highlight of our trip up to that moment. In particular, we were drawn to the huge variety of butterflies. We saw tiger swallowtails and red admirals, but above all, the monarchs were everywhere. They would compete for space on the verbena flowers and get pushed around by the wind like elaborate kites, holding onto a branch until the gust would go away. We were taking tons of photos and short videos, calling each other over to look at this or that. Then I spotted an odd butterfly on a dark red and purple flower that looked like a bruise. The insect was white and fuzzy and very elegant, like some sort of tiny dove. An older local woman with a big expensive camera slung around her neck told us it was a satin moth, not a butterfly at all. She said it was unusual to see one during the day. She also said that her parents called them angels because back in the day when death was more of an everyday reality, you could often see one resting on a dead body. Some people would assume it was the soul of the deceased, although more likely they were attracted to the smell of death. My wife sniffed the dark flower and said, Yeah, that is so weird. That flower is a little stinky. On our way back, my wife complained about a headache, so we set our next activity aside and drove back to the cabin for her to get some rest. She lied down, looking pale and frail, her sun-kissed cheeks drained of all color. Then, while dozing off, she let loose a huge gasping sound and reached her arms toward me in despair. I realized she was having an allergic reaction. I rifled through her purse and her bags while she gasped, looking for an inhaler or EpiPen. It got worse and worse. She was violently flailing and trying to breathe, and I could not find anything helpful. I tried to call 911, but I could not get a signal, and I paced frantically around the cabin, trying at least to get the Wi-Fi to work. When I returned to the bedroom, she was completely still, motionless and a little blue. On her forehead, there was a little white moth that instantly flew away. I just snapped. I lost it. I started to cry and pound my fist on the wall. Just a few hours ago, we had been laughing and enjoying a fun vacation together. And now suddenly, I was all alone in the world. I got chills and felt weak in my knees. But then I thought... What if I could catch the moth? What if it really is her soul in there somewhere? I looked around the room frantically, but it seemed to have disappeared entirely. Losing the moth felt like losing my wife all over again, but I was not going to let it happen. In hindsight, I realized how mad I had gone, chasing an insect as she lied motionless on the bed instead of trying to drive her to the nearest hospital. After a few frantic minutes, I changed my strategy up and turned off all the lights except for a single lamp. I sat there for a while, during which my mind raced, wondering of the societal and legal repercussions of what had just happened. What would her family think of me? Would the police be suspicious? What was I going to do now? A part of me was grateful we had not had kids yet, even though all our married friends kept telling us how wonderful they are. When the moth landed on the lampshade, I wondered, what now? I stared at it through blurry, teary eyes. It paid me no mind as it soaked up the light and warmth of the lamp. I slowly cupped my hands around the insect, the angel, and caught it between them. But I was hit by a wave of terror. Had I squished it, it would be so easy. I would not even notice if I did kill it. But I felt some tickling, its satin wings on the palms of my hand. My mood had swung in the other direction. 
I was manic and euphoric. I actually laughed at the sensation, thinking of my wife tickling me when I did not feel like getting out of bed on a weekend. I walked over to her motionless body and placed my cupped hands on her forehead. I moved my hands away, and the moth had landed on her and remained there motionless. Her color was drained, and her skin resembled the color of the perfectly white moth. I just stared, not knowing what to do next. Then the moth started to fly away, and I tried to push it back onto her, crushing it against her forehead. She had a small dark stain, cross-like, like when we go to Ash Wednesday at our church. I finally let go and said goodbye. That is when she sat up all of a sudden, gasping for air. I instinctually put my arms around her and held her as she gasped again and again. I was crying so hard. I was so grateful, but that feeling would not last. She whispered something in my ear, so soft it was inaudible. I asked her to speak up. Please, baby, please speak up. And she did. She asked me why. Why what, baby? Why did you bring me back? She promptly went to sleep, but I was so worked up with a mixture of grief and relief that all I could do was stare at her shallow breathing body and that mark I had accidentally smeared on her. In the morning, she silently showered and packed her bags. Occasionally, I would hug her or kiss her, but she would not really reciprocate. She would just let me do it without opposing me. It felt like she was a million miles away. During the car trip, I kept asking her what she meant about bringing her back, but she would not respond. Instead, I decided to go into cheerleader mode, trying to point out cool sights or make little jokes to improve her mood. It was like she was not there, though. All she would do was stare out the window. When we got back to our house, I was starting to lose it. I did not know what I could do. Do you take somebody unresponsive to the hospital? Like, did she have brain damage from not breathing? Was I actively hurting her by pretending everything was normal? Was she actually getting worse? Panic set in, but when I would ask her if she was okay, she would say, Yes, let's talk about it in the morning. Once again, she seemed to drift off instantly, almost like flipping off a switch. I was up for a couple of hours reading medical articles on the internet, but I too started to doze off, losing track of the last paragraph I had read on brain damage and near-death experiences. I finally lied down next to her and put my arm over her gently breathing body. I woke up alone, with the car gone. I called my wife's cell phone, thinking that she had driven herself to the hospital, and her pillow started to buzz. I called her folks, waking them up early in the morning, but they had no idea where she could be. I did not tell them about the near-death experience, just that she had left without telling me where she was going. By noon, I was panicking, and called the police. They said I would have to wait 24 hours. So instead, I started to call every hospital and clinic in the region. Nobody had seen her. Eventually, the police would get involved, and I was questioned again and again. I was their only lead after all. After a few days alternating between people feeling sorry for me and suspicious of me, everything suddenly changed. The troopers in Maine had found our car, abandoned in the middle of a highway that overlooked a field of flowers. They searched the area, but found no body. They did not know if they would find a body, given just how much ground there was to cover, even before it turned back into dense woods. We worked under the assumption that she was still alive, and the police seemed less concerned I could be involved. That night, I had an odd dream. In my dream, I had woken up to noises and went into the kitchen, where I saw my wife in a long, flowing white robe, carrying a cup of tea. As soon as I saw her, I started to cry and tell her that I loved her again and again. She took a sip of tea and walked into the living room. I followed her, unable to ever catch up as I was moving in extremely slow motion. She seemed to not even notice me, sipping tea and pacing about. Then she moved through the double doors into the garden. I slowly moved towards her, desperate to catch up with her and touch her, feel her warmth again. Before I could reach her, she turned and said, Don't worry, baby. I'm not mad at you. I'm really happy now. 
The robe around her opened into huge white fuzzy wings, revealing her pale nudity beneath it. The wings moved slowly a couple of times, as if testing themselves, and then pushed down hard, lifting her into the air. The gust knocked me over, and within seconds, she was barely visible, outlined by the moon, like a moth drawn to a source of light. She got further and further, and I woke up to a ringing noise. It was the police calling my cell phone. They had found her in a patch of dark purple and red flowers in the middle of the woods. There was no sign of struggle. She was just laid out like she had gone to sleep in the middle of them. Her eyes were bloodshot, as though she had suffocated due to a strong asthma attack. The police said they would have never even noticed her, had they not been attracted by the fluttering of white moths on the flowers. Hey guys and ladies, thanks for watching. Send your story or creepypasta to the email in the description. My shirts, Patreon, Instagram, and Twitter are down there too. Anything you do to help support the channel is much appreciated. Likes and up. I'm going to be getting back to at least doing once a week. And I know I, I, I haven't done a true thing in a while and I'm going to do that. Just had some things going on for a little bit here, so. Be good to animals, even people. See ya. Is it a coyote? What did you hear? Is it a coyote? Need protection of the daddy? Good job. <laughs>